Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started in just a couple of minutes. I know everybody's coming from other sessions, so we're going to give people a few minutes here to, to sign on. So um, we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Okay, um, since I know we've got a lot of content to cover, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we've got a couple of housekeeping things while people are still tuning in. Um, so just welcome, first welcome to our uh, session, our AB 1234 ethics training. Um, a few housekeeping items to get us going. Um, if you have a question during the webinar, you can ask that at any time by entering that into the questions box, which you should see on the right-hand channel of your screen. Um, we'll be taking questions throughout, so please don't, um, don't save them till the end. Make sure you, you pop those in at any point um, when they come up. I'm sure you're all eager to figure out how you get credit for this session, uh, since this is a state-mandated training. Um, hopefully, since you're here, you have your own login that's associated with your name, because that's who the certificates will be issued to. You do have to be present for the full two hours um, or the full full length of the training, um, which should go just about the full two hours. Um, and then throughout the presentation, we will be asking a number of polling questions um, just to make sure that you didn't turn on the webinar and then leave the room or anything. So um, please keep your eye out for that. Uh, we won't be grading them, so they don't have, you don't have to have the right answer. You just have to make sure that you're participating in those. Um, and they'll pop up on your screen and they're all multiple choice. You just click the answer and we'll give you a little bit more detail on how to take care of that when we get to those questions um, during the webinar. A few other housekeeping items. Um, you will receive your certificate via email by the end of this month. Um, if you're an attorney on the line and looking for MCLE credit, um, please reach out to us and let us know. We do offer that. Um, as a, as a bonus here for any attorneys that are on the line. So my email you see there on the screen, um, please shoot me an email, let me know that 
um, you attended this session uh, and that you're an attorney um, and share your bar number with me and we'll make sure to get you the appropriate um, forms and credit on that front as well. Um, if you have any questions um, or concerns following this training, if you need additional information, um, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is there on the screen. Um, before we get started, I just want to share a little bit of information about the Institute for Local Government. Uh, my name is Melissa Keen. I'm Program Manager uh, with ILG and will be your moderator for this afternoon's training. Um, we are a nonprofit, um, nonpartisan affiliate of the League of California Cities, the California State Association of Counties, and the California Special District Association. Uh, we provide practical and easy to use resources that local officials can effectively implement policies on the ground. We do this in a number of ways. Um, we provide a lot of education and training, such as the webinar you're all on today. Um, in addition to that, we provide technical assistance and capacity building services for local government statewide, as well as convening and facilitation um, services as well. Uh, we focus on a number of different program areas. Um, the, this session today related to ethics as part of our leadership and governance work, um, where we do provide state-mandated trainings, as well as other resources and trainings to help um, local officials and staff um, do their jobs more efficiently and effectively. Um, we have a lot of information from people who are new to public service in that space, um, as well as resources uh, to help you all work as, better as a team, um, both internally as a council, with your staff, and with your community. Uh, we have a program focused on civic education and workforce, um, which helps create a pipe, pipeline to public service and facilitate municipal school relationships, um, and really just offer local government as a, um, a career path to young people in our communities. We have a program focused on public engagement, which covers a whole host of things, um, from getting started to dealing with difficult meeting participants to um, using technology and, and really trying to master virtual engagement in this new world we're all in. Um, and then we have a program on, on sustainable communities, which um, helps with things like housing, um, connecting local governments to cap and trade funding. Um, we do a lot of work around energy efficiency and greenhouse gas reduction. Um, so if you aren't familiar with us, um, I definitely encourage you to go to our website and check out all of the resources and training um, opportunities that we have. So our uh, president presenter this afternoon um, is Joan Cox with ILG and league partner Burke Williams and Sorensen. I'm gonna go ahead and change, um, give her the um, ability here to share her screen and take it from here. Joan? Great. Let's see. All right, can you see my screen? I can. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, hello everybody and welcome. Uh, uh, there are some polling questions throughout this presentation, but I will also be asking some other questions of you as we go. Just feel free to use the questions box to respond uh, with multiple choice or A, B, C, or D, or yes or no. All right, and with that, I'm just going to jump right into it. So what's this all about? Well, I'm gonna start off uh, with an example of seven city of Beaumont officials who, who were have found to have misappropriated 43 million uh, in bond, contract, fee, and loan funds over two decades. They were, as a result, facing 16 to 26 years in prison with $5 million bail. Uh, they pled guilty and were ultimately ordered to pay $8 million in restitution, although fortunately none of them uh, ended up serving jail time. So the main purpose of today's seminar is to make sure all of us are very well aware of our ethical obligations and how to avoid any pitfalls such as these. The next example is Jeffrey Hubbard, a former Beverly Hills USD superintendent. He faced two counts of felony misappropriation of public funds because he approved a car allowance of $500, even though the contract called for a car allowance of $150. And he approved a $20,000 stipend for an employee without board approval. Uh, the Supreme Court held that Penal Code 424 applies broadly to every person with some control over public funds. As a result, he was sentenced to 60 days in jail, 200 
80 hours of community service, $23,500 restitution, and a $6,000 fine. So we are not like those officials. We want to make sure our name never shows up in the Fair Political Practices Commission Hall of Shame. Uh, for your information, this is the website where you can see summaries of past enforcement cases. They also have a very helpful website in terms of asking questions with quick turnaround times. All right, so on today's agenda, we will go over ethics principles. We will go over personal advantages and perks of office. We will cover personal financial gain and we will cover fair, open, and impartial processes and decision-making under the Brown Act and the California Public Records Act. So, morals, ethics, and legalities. What's the difference? Morals are a person's standards of behavior or beliefs concerning what is and is not acceptable for them to do. Ethics are moral principles that govern a person's or group's behavior and legalities are the quality or state of being in accordance with the law. So how do those interact? Well, laws and policies establish what the public employee must do. They include clearly stated requirements of behavior as well as general principles of ethical behavior. And then ethics have legal and disciplinary consequences. So the law sets the floor for ethical behavior but the public will often hold officials to a higher standard. That's where reliance on general ethical principles comes in. The public expects public employees to act ethically whether or not doing so is required by law or policy. So public employees must always consider the perception as well as the reality. So this test shows that there's a hierarchy of steps to resolving dilemmas. You need to start with what's legal, but then go beyond that to ensure that your action is consistent with your community's values and your own. Finally, you should look at the issue objectively from an outsider's perspective as a news reporter would. If you still don't like the way the headline will read, don't do it. And of course, if you're unsure, ask for help. So California law promotes ethics, one, by requiring public disclosure, two, by prohibiting certain actions, and three, by punishing violations. So we'll go over all three of those. All right, uh, general ethical principles. Uh, ethical values include professional, trustworthy, uh, community first, respect, and fairness. And I'm gonna go through each of those. But first, here's my first uh, hypothetical. So you have a major meeting tomorrow, but it's playoff season and there's a great game on TV. Should you A, skim the meeting agenda package during commercials, B, have your spouse read the materials and advise what to do, C, remain silent at the meeting and consent to the staff recommendation, D, none of the above. So if you don't mind, uh, jot your response in our question box. And just quickly to jump in here, Joan, um, to clarify for everybody on the phone, so we'll, we'll have a number of these questions that are just kind of aimed at um, making you think about some of the material. Um, they aren't all the explicit polling questions, um, so we'll flag for you when you actually have to answer the questions to get credit. So I just want to make that um, clear for you all. Great. And while you were making those comments, I see that we have universal uh, responses of D, which of course is the correct answer. All right, so I'm now gonna go over those values that I mentioned a moment ago, and the first is professional. So what does this look like in practice? It means coming prepared to meetings, having read and studied any materials and information provided. It means respecting confidential information, following through and taking responsibility for your actions, and keeping your knowledge and skills current. So, uh, this next question is one of your polling questions, so you do need to answer this for credit. Uh, and here it is. Your neighbor, who is a friend, has an application coming before the council that staff recommends against approving because of negative impacts and code conflicts. Should you A, impose extra conditions to look tough, but still approve? 
B, remain silent and approve. C, tell the applicant to move to another community. D, none of the above. So I'm going to pause. Right, so I'm going to go ahead and launch this as a poll. Um, so you should all now be able to see, now be able to see um, the answers in a polling format. Um, so I will um, leave this up here for a bit so that you all have a chance to respond. If you're having any tech difficulties, definitely drop those into the, the questions box or the chat um, so that we can help you and make sure that you're getting credit here as well. About 75% of you have voted, so we'll give you just a little bit more time here. You'll see the answers are still there. All right, you'll let almost me Yeah, we've got almost everybody answered here. I um, just want to give people a chance. If you haven't, um, this is kind of your last call to, to get your, your vote in here. I see someone's asking a question in the question box about the poll. Uh, okay, what is this question? Is yeah. It, we, yeah, so we did receive responses to the first quick poll. The first quick poll was not an official poll for credit. Uh, we will be, I see some of you just came in the room, so I'm just going to repeat the fact that we will be asking questions throughout the presentation just uh, as part of the engagement process, but only seven questions will actually be subject to the poll and um, require your response for credit. So we're just uh, waiting for final responses to the first poll, which is on your screen now. Yes, and again, um, we aren't grading these, um, so just make sure that you're responding um, either to get you thinking and we'll talk through the answer um, when we close this out. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this um, and then I am going to share it with you guys so you can um, see the answers here. Okay, so 95% of you answered none of the above. That is the best answer. 5% uh, of you uh, answered remain silent and approve. It is possible to approve an application even when it could have negative impacts and code conflicts, but uh, if it is your friend who has the application and staff is recommending against approving it, uh, you should uh, not approve it or recuse yourself from the consideration of that matter. All right, next value is community first. What does that look like? It means you make impartial decisions free of narrow political interests and financial and other personal interests that may impair your independence of judgment or action. It means you comply with both the spirit and the letter of the law. That includes the constitution, state law, city code, and city policies. And you do not use any agency resources or your position for personal gain. The next, oh, here's the next question. This is not the subject of a poll. This is just for your participation. So you realize that you forgot to file a report required by a state agency. Should you, A, blow it off because it's a state agency. B, tell the city manager you assigned the project to a coworker. C, call the agency and tell them the report got sent to the wrong address, or D, none of the above. So feel free to put your response in the question box. This is not an official poll. All right, I've already seen a number of responses. All of you have the right response, which of course is D. All right, trustworthiness. What does this value look like? First, you act truthfully with the public, agency officials and staff. You use accurate information, do what you say you're going to do, and use your title only when conducting official agency business, carefully considering whether you're exceeding or appearing to exceed your authority. 
The next ethical principle is respect. What does that value look like? You treat people with courtesy and equitably. I listen carefully. I'm engaged. I ask questions. I involve staff. I work toward consensus. I'll just add that when involving staff, it's always best to give a heads up uh, in advance if you're able, if you read a staff report in advance, give staff a head up if you're planning to ask them a question. All right, here's the next question. This is not a polling question. It's okay to A, reject an application because the applicant is a jerk. B, only consider agency staff's position on a decision. C, encourage questions from members of the public during meetings. D, none of the above. So which is the best answer? And please answer in the question box. This is not a, an official polling question. Okay, most of you have come up with C, which is the correct answer. So it is okay and actually advisable to encourage questions from members of the public during meetings. All right, fairness. What does this value look like? I focus on merits, not on personalities. I promote public involvement. I provide more process than required. I consider all sides and I apply policies consistently. So those are our ethical values. Now, what, oh, and here's one more question. <clears throat> Again, this is not an official polling question. A member of the public comes to the agency and asks how to obtain a permit. It is okay to, A, ignore the person because this information is already available on the agency's website. B, tell the person to check the agency's code, then walk away. C, ask the appropriate agency staff member to assist the individual. D, refuse to answer the question because you dislike the individual's business. All right, I see a number of you already answering in the question box. And of course, the correct answer is C, ask the appropriate agency staff member to assist the individual. And this is an example of, um, in, of utilizing staff and providing more process than required. All right, so what are our duties as a public official? Uh, there are supervisory obligations. All public officials are required to follow all city policies. Violations of policy will result in appropriate disciplinary action. And it's important as a supervisor to lead by example. Public officials are expected to lead by example in all things, including engaging in ethical behavior, Subordinates should be able to model their behavior from you. As a supervisor, you also have an obligation to enforce the rules. So you have an obligation to enforce all city policies. If a public official has any reason to believe that an employee is acting unethically, he or she must report that concern. There's an obligation to enforce conduct within and outside the chain of com command. And when in doubt, speak up and ask for help. All right, so bearing these principles in mind, the first part that we'll discuss is legal limitations on official benefits and perks. So let's talk about gifts. What is a gift? A gift is anything of value you receive for which you do not provide monetary or other consideration of equal or greater value. It may include discounts and rebates, if not also given to the general public. In a moment, we'll delve more deeply into reporting obligations, which are $50 or more in a year with a $460 limit. So where do you report? On your Form 700. And we will discuss today a couple of roles for your Form 700, but the first is disclosure of gifts. So you must, on your Form 700, report the total value of all gifts from any source during the calendar year that is at least $50. Gifts are reportable regardless of the location of the donor. So if you have a um, colleague outside of your city's jurisdiction who provides a gift, you must still report it. 
If the amount is unknown, you must make a good faith estimate of the item's fair market value. All right, are meals gifts? A, yes, if the food is delicious. B, no, if the company is boring. C, no, if you take turns paying. D, only if you go to a restaurant. So what's the best answer? This is not an official poll. You can simply provide your answer in the question box. All right, most of you have the correct answer, which is actually C. So uh, some of you answer D only if you go to a restaurant, but uh, if someone throws um, an event in their home, uh, that still qualifies as a meal that is a gift, unless they are a personal friend. So a meal is a gift unless provided at an individual's home with whom you have an existing relationship. So if you go to a fundraiser, um, then that is still a gift. Uh, meals are gifts unless they're provided as part of a reciprocal exchange or paid for by a governmental agency. And it looks like my uh, presentation went back to the beginning for some reason. Let me just get us where we are. Okay. So there's a rule for everything. Gifts through family members, attendance at invitation-only events, wedding gifts, and nonprofit fundraisers. Any person or entity which has been a source of gifts, including promised gifts of $460 or more in the prior 12 months. So here's an example of a party that was a bit too lavish for public officials. So a downtown developer threw a party so posh that it violated state and local gift limits for public officials who attended, barring five of them from working on his projects for a year. It turns out that the per person cost at this celebration, including food, drink, entertainment, and other amenities, totaled $805. So this is a good example of a, an event at a home uh, that nevertheless resulted in a reporting uh, obligation and actually exceeded the annual um, gift limit. Here's another uh, example of an FPPC enforcement decision. James L., as a mayor of Palmdale, failed to timely disclose gifts of two meals totaling $253.39 on his Form 700. All gifts were received from E.J. De La Rosa and Company. As a result of that, the FPPC fined him $200. Um, in Sacramento, spurred by an investigation by the Ventura County District Attorney's Office into the activities of Oxnard city officials, the FPPC found 205 governmental officials across the state failed to properly report gifts from the same companies involved in the Oxnard case. So um, this obligation is important, um, both for transparency and to ensure um, no conflict of interest. Here's another enforcement decision. Judith V., the former mayor of the city of San Bernardino, uh, accepted membership dues from the Arrowhead Country Club, which exceeded the 200, 2004 gift limit of $340, as well as the 2005 gift limit of $360. Her fine for that was $400. Another example is Mark R., Director of Recreation and Parks for the City of Santa Rosa. He received gifts including free golf course access, range access, cart use, lessons, and merchandise discounts that exceeded the reporting threshold of $50. He failed to report these gifts on his Form 700. He received gifts exceeding the applicable gift limit from one source. As a result, he was fined $6,500.
So when you receive a gift over $50, what are your options? Uh, first, decide if you want to report it on your Form 700. If so, report it within 30 days of receipt. If not, then within 30 days, reimburse the gift, return it unused, or donate it to charity. But you don't get to take a deduction for that charitable donation because if you did, you would still reap a benefit. If the gift exceeds $470, you have no choice. You have a duty to reject it. All right, here's our next polling question. This is an official poll. Can public officials accept tips for a job well done? A, never. B, always. C, only if you want, to, only if you do an extra good job. And D, yes, if you have a performance-based contract. Great. Thank you, Jean. I'm going to go ahead and launch this one officially. Um, so you all should see a box pop up on your screen um, with the question and the and the responses. So please make sure you you respond to this one um, via that poll, not just in the questions box. And to to assist you in this answer, I'm going to go ahead and give you the definition of a tip. A tip is a gratuity or a sum of money customarily given by a client or customer to certain service sector workers for the service they have performed in addition to the basic price of the service. So that's the definition of a tip. All right, and I'm going to pause and um, our moderator will help with the poll. Got about 85% of you have voted, so we'll just give you another few seconds here to get everybody um, a chance to respond. And again, um, it looks like some of you popped on since we did the opening, um, just to reiterate a couple of housekeeping items around how to get credit. Um, you do have to be present for the full presentation here today, as well as respond to these polling questions that we'll be doing throughout the um, throughout the presentation um, so that we can get credit and process those certificates. Um, and I'm sure this will come up again, so just to make sure um, you all hear this as well, um, you should receive those certificates via email by the end of this month. I think we've got almost everybody here, just another couple seconds in case somebody's still trying to make a choice. Go ahead and close this, and then I will uh, share the responses with everybody. Okay, so uh, the uh, most of you got the correct answer. The answer is never. It is actually a misdemeanor to receive any kind of gratuity or reward for performing one's duties. That is why I gave you the definition of a tip, because it is true that if you have a performance-based contract, you may receive bonuses based on performance. That is not illegal. Um, the contract, of course, has to be approved by your governing body. Um, but I am making a distinction here between a performance-based bonus and a tip. So it is a tip that you may never accept. It's actually a misdemeanor. Okay, honoraria, receipt of honoraria, any payment for speech, article, attendance at a conference event or similar gathering is prohibited unless it's a speech or article in connection with your private business. Uh, you can return or donate the honoraria within 30 days of receipt. So here's an example. An ex-member of the governor's cabinet actually paid $5,400 in ethics fines. This was a former member of Governor Schwarzenegger's cabinet who resigned uh, in 2009 and paid $5,400 to a state watchdog agency for violating the ban on accepting speaking fees. It was not an excuse that any other administration officials knew what she was doing or that no one advised her to stop. All right, here's our next question. This is not a polling question. You may simply answer this in the questions box. 
Agency officials can set their salary, A, as high as they want or can get away with, B, by ordinance, C, whenever they want, D, none of the above. Okay, so the correct answer is uh, B, uh, compensation is generally fixed by statute. Increases, if permitted, usually require a public vote or an ordinance. Uh, compensation cannot be acted on at a special meeting and automatic increases are not permitted. All right, here's our next question. This is not an official polling question. You may simply answer this question in the questions box. If you take your spouse on official business, you can charge the following to the city. A, room. B, spouse's meals. C, mileage. D, both A and C. Or E, none of the above. So, Actually, we do have this one as a polling question, so I'm going to go ahead and launch this for oh, you all. So sorry, sorry for the confusion. I didn't have this one noted. Sorry about that. So you all should see this pop up on your screen. I see a lot of you responding already. It's just another couple of minutes or a couple of seconds here, about 85 people, 85% 85 of you have already responded. Um, so again, which of those following charges can you um, charge to the city? I'm gonna wait till you publish the poll and then I'll provide it, the answer. Perfect, I am, I'll go ahead and Okay, it's just a couple more seconds in case any final responses are coming in. I'm gonna go ahead and close that and I will share the responses here. So you guys can see that there was almost a 50-50 split between answers D and E. And uh, that makes a lot of sense because um, not every agency reimburses for uh, room and mileage when performing official business, but many agencies do. Uh, the general rule is that agencies will reimburse actual and necessary expenses. So the most popular answer is D, which is uh, that you can charge your room and your mileage to the city. Um, if you got a bigger room in order to accommodate your spouse, of course, that incremental expense cannot be charged to the city. Um, it's important when seeking expense reimbursement that your reporting be timely uh, with receipts. Um, also, you should provide an oral report at subsequent meeting uh, for attendance at Brown Act meetings. Uh, the penalty is a loss of the reimbursement privilege, restitution, civil penalties, three times the value of misused resources, potential jail, and ban from public office. So again, this is a big deal. Remember, your expense report forms are public records. All right, here's my next question. This is not an official polling question, so please simply answer in the questions box. A local store owner offers to give you an iPad in appreciation of your excellent work. You must A, tell the city manager, B, give it to your children, C, ask the value before accepting, D, give it to charity and take a tax deduction. E, politely refuse the offer. For purposes of this hypothetical, I'm going to presume that an iPad is worth $500, which is probably underestimating its value. <laughs> All right, I see universal uh, ease. The answer is politely refuse the offer. You are not allowed to accept anything 
uh, worth more than $470 in one year. Um, D is not the correct answer because you don't get to take a tax deduction uh, when you give a gift that you received for your public office uh, to charity. You cannot reap any advantage from that gift to charity. All right, here's the next one. Again, this is not official, so pl please just answer in the questions box. It's not okay to A, make a few personal copies on the agency copy machine. B, call your spouse from an agency phone. C, use an agency truck to pick up a new mattress. D, all of the above. So you can just put your answer. I see a bunch of Ds, which was all of the above. Here's the rule. Uh, there is no use of public funds or resources for personal non-public purposes allowed, including campaigns. Public resources include staff time, office equipment, and supplies, but exclude incidental or minimal uses. Penalties are disqualification from office, jail, civil penalties up to $1,000 a day, plus three times the value of the unlawful use. So it, it's important to ensure that an expense or use is consistent with adopted city policy or practice. I'm gonna go, bearing this definition in mind, I'm gonna go back. Uh, most of you answered D, all of the above. Um, it's possible uh, that under the incidental or minimal use exception, you could make a phone call or make a couple of copies, but the best policy and best practice is to avoid all of that. So the best answer to that is D. And here's an example. So top fire officials suspected of driving county vehicles while collecting $1,000 in monthly personal car allowance. So uh, San Bernardino County Fire Chief Pat Denon was actually placed on unpaid administrative leave after county supervisors uh, found that he and others improperly drove vehicles for personal use. Solicitations of political support. So soliciting campaign funds from city officers or employees is unlawful, except when included as part of a communication to a significant segment of the community. What does that mean? If you're running for office and you send out a postcard to all residents in the community, and that happens to include city officers or employees, um, that's acceptable. Uh, it's also unacceptable to condition employment and compensation decisions on political support. Further, uh, officials cannot receive loans from anyone within the official city or with whom the city contracts and cannot receive loans greater than $500 except in writing and with clear terms. An exception is a loan received by the officials campaign committee uh, normal bank and credit indebtedness, and loans from family members. Here's an example of an FPPC enforcement decision. Antoinette R. was the inspection services manager for the City of Oakland Community and Economic Development Agency. Uh, she violated conflict of interest laws when she approved and signed a series of contracts with a contractor, her former brother-in-law, from whom she had received a loan in the amount of $50,000. As a result of that misaction, she was fined $6,500. Here's another example. A California public water district that earned uh, uh, was actually fined by a federal agency uh, in the amount of $125,000. Um, their former deputy general manager received a $1.4 million loan at 0.84% interest to buy a home in 2007 and was given until 2021 to repay the final $1 million owing. Um, to make matters worse, he actually resigned his position, sold the home, bought a home elsewhere, and still had not repaid the loan.
Another example is Richard F., a Doris City Council member who was found to have violated conflict of interest laws by voting to obtain a $491,520 state grant to extend a water and sewer line to an area of the city where he owned real property and operated an inn and restaurant. He was fined $4,000. Okay, so that's it on gifts and perks. We're now going to move on to personal financial gain. So this is obvious, bribery and extortion, requesting, receiving, or agreeing to receive anything of value, including an advantage in exchange for official action or using an official position to gain something of value is a crime. Penalties include criminal fines, forfeiture of office, and disqualification from office. Here's an example. Uh, Kudehi Mayor David M. Silva uh, resigned after he was arrested for bribery. It turns out that he was accused of taking $17,000 in bribes from a marijuana dispensary owner who was working as an FBI informant. Uh, he and others allegedly took the bribes in exchange for their help in opening a store in that town. Um, I told you uh, that we would cover conflict of interest, and conflict of interest is covered by two different statutes. One is the Political Reform Act, which is Government Code Section 87100. The other is Contractual Conflicts of Interest, which is covered by Government Code Section 1090. So, essentially, public officials owe a paramount loyalty to the public. Personal or private financial interests should not be allowed to enter into the decision-making process. And I told you that your Form 700 would be discussed a couple of times during today's seminar. This is the second time. Uh, on your Form 700, you are also, another purpose of it is to alert officials of personal interests that might be affected and to inform the public about potential conflicts. So, who must disclose? All designated officials. What must they disclose? Interests in real property, investments, business positions, sources of income, and gifts. When must they disclose? Upon assuming office, annually after assuming office, and upon leaving office. Interestingly, you must also file a Form 700 when running for office where you file it with your local agency, which will send it if required to the FPPC. And of course, your Form 700 is a public record. Um, members of the public may gain access to and review your Form 700. Late filers may face fines or penalties. Uh, someone asked about uh, gifts. So your Form 700 is due annually. But if you receive a gift in excess of $50, you should report that gift within 30 days of receipt, unless you return it. Here are a couple of uh, enforcement decisions. The first, Jackson W., as a member of the Sunshine Ordinance Task Force for the City and County of San Francisco, failed to timely file his 2012 Annual Statement of Economic Interests, his Form 700. He was fined. $200 for not filing on time. Why is it important to file the Form 700? Um, to disclose any potential conflicts of interest. So here's the general rule of disqualification. A public official may not make, participate, influence a governmental decision that will have a foreseeable and material financial effect on the official's economic interests. This brings us to our next official polling question. So you may answer this in the poll. The best time to discuss a potential conflict with the agency's attorney is A, at a meeting because it is convenient and will save money. B, after the action slash decision so you know all the facts. C, as early as possible. D, never, because it's not a privileged communication. 
I'm going to go ahead and launch this so you all should see it pop up on your screen. The number of you already responding. Great. Give this just another few seconds here. Make sure everybody has a chance to respond. This is great. We're at 100%. About 90% of you have responded, so just another couple seconds here. I'm going to go ahead and close this and I will uh, share the responses. So we had almost 100% with C as early as possible. That's the correct answer. A couple of you answered D, never, because it's not a privileged communication. Even though um, the city attorney does not represent individual council members, you may still discuss potential conflicts of interest with the city attorney. And we actually encourage that you do so. Uh, because conflict rules and regulations are complex and recognizing potential conflicts is essential. So the best rule of thumb is to talk early on with the city attorney and consider seeking advice from the FPPC when economic interests may be affected positively or negatively by a decision. Interestingly, the FPPC receives over 20,000 requests for advice every year. So uh, many people use the FPPC website as a resource, uh, but just that numerosity reveals how frequently potential conflicts of interest arise. All right, I'm going to talk about potential economic interests, uh, personal finances, uh, include any economic interest in personal finances, expenses, income, assets, other than real property or business entity interests or liabilities of an official or the official's immediate family, which will have a measurable financial benefit or loss from the decision. So here's an example. This came from an FPPC advice letter. A zero emission vehicle grant could become a potential basis for disqualifying a CARB employee or official from making, participating in making, or influencing governmental decisions of CARB relating to the ZEV grant program. Given that ZEV grants may total up to $9,000, it's reasonable to assume that a ZEV grant recipient would receive at least $250 per year over the three-year life of the grant. Therefore, if a CARB employee or official is planning to apply for a ZEV grant, he or she could have a potential disqualifying conflict of interest in governmental decisions directly or indirectly involving the ZEV grant program. Uh, what are sources of income? Any source of income of $500 or more during the prior 12 months for you or your spouse or your domestic partner. Here's an FPPC enforcement decision example. David S., a member of the board of directors of the Indian Valley Hospital District, was found to have violated the conflict of interest provisions when he voted in favor of a contract which benefited a client of his oxygen supply business. He was fined $2,000. Uh, potential economic interests also include business management, employment, or investments. Any business entity in which an official is a director, officer, partner, trustee, manager, or employee, and any business entity in which an official has a direct or indirect investment of $2,000 or more. Here's the next example. Leonard E. was the assistant city manager and controller of the city of West Covina. He violated the conflict of interest disclosure and disqualification provisions by failing to disclose his interests in an Orange Julius franchise located in a shopping mall and by participating in decising relating to a ma major expansion and restoration 
of the mall. He was fined $18,000. Here's another example. Robert B., while a member of the Tuolumne Utilities District Board of Directors, made governmental decisions in which he knew or had reason to know he had a financial interest by voting to approve numerous claim summaries that included payments made to Behe Enterprises, a corporation in which he held the position of director. He was fined $12,000. All right, here's our next question. This is not an official poll. Interests in real property are A, a potential ground for a conflict of interest. B, not a conflict if it is your home because of the homestead exemption. C, not a problem as long as your property is more than 300 feet away. D, always a conflict if the property is within the, jur the agency's jurisdiction. So answers here are all over the board. So um, this is actually um, a bit of a trick question because uh, in 2019, uh, the FPPC changed the materiality standard for decisions that affect ownership interests in real property. There's now a presumption that a decision involving property within 500 feet of an official's property will have a material impact on the official's interest. Uh, notably, there is also a presumption that a decision involving property a thousand feet or more from the official's property will not have a material impact on the official's interest. Both of these presumptions can be rebutted with clear and convincing evidence. Um, for decisions involving property between 500 and a thousand feet from the official's property, the decision uh, depends on a number of factors. So under revised regulations, a decision will have a material impact if it would change the parcel's development potential, income producing potential, highest and best use, market value, or if it would change the parcel's character by substantially altering traffic levels, intensity of use, parking, view, privacy, noise levels, or air quality. So potential economic interests include any real property interest worth $2,000 or more, and that includes leasehold interests in some instances. So be alert for any projects or decisions that may affect the land use or value of the property or other nearby properties. There are two exceptions to potential financial conflicts. Those exceptions uh, involve the public generally, and the legally required participation. And I'm gonna go over each of those. So the public generally exception concerns decisions that affect a broad range of persons or interests and may be exempted. That would be 25% of all businesses or all real property or all individuals. So an example would be water rate decisions or sign code amendments. So the reason for this exception is that uh, the financial effect on a public official or the official's interests is indistinguishable from its effect on the public generally. Um, this exception should be considered with care. An official may not just assume it applies. There are rules for identifying the specific segments of the general population with which the official must compare the official's financial interest. So the best course is to contact agency counsel or the FPPC concerning these specific rules. The other exception is the legally required participation exception. So this exception may apply if a conflict disqualifies so many officials that there's no longer a quorum to make a decision. This exception does not apply, one, if a quorum could later be met, or two, to break a tie vote. So again, this exception applies only in very specific circumstances in which the governmental agency would be paralyzed or unable to act. 
All right, gifts of public funds. Local agencies are prohibited from making gift of public money or anything of value. Expenditures for public purposes are not considered gifts, even if a private party incidentally benefits. Uh, similarly, uh, misuse of public resources is, of course, prohibited. An example is current and former Irwindale officials were tried for embezzlement. Uh, they um, were accused of misusing city money for tickets to baseball games and Broadway shows while on official trips to New York. There's also a prohibition on mass mailing. So no newsletter or other mass mailing may be sent at public expense. The purpose is to conserve resources no advantages for incumbents. Um, this applies to 200 plus items per month where the official is featured. Uh, penalties include criminal liability and restitution. Here's an example. Uh, the city of Rockland was fined $2,000 by the California Fair Political Practices Commission for blanketing households with 30,000 copies of a newsletter that contained photos of city council members. That was found to be a violation of the Political Reform Act. All right, so now I'm gonna to turn to contractual conflicts of interest. This is government code section 1090. And section 1090 prohibits officials and employees from having financial interests in contracts made by them in their official capacities or any board of which they are members. So if a public official or employee has a financial interest in a contract, the contract is prohibited regardless of whether the official participates in or abstains from the actual decision. The term contract is liberally construed. Financial gain is not required. There are a couple of limited exceptions. One of those is if the contract existed before assuming office, so long as no modifications are made during the official's tenure. And uh, the other exception is if the interest is terminated prior to participation. Importantly, if a contract is made in violation of Section 1090, the contract will be deemed void and all monies paid under the contract must be returned to the local city. Beyond that, willful violations may be punished by fine, imprisonment, and disqualification from public office. All right, this next question is not an official polling question. May an official in one agency department accept money from a third party to influence contract negotiations with a different department in the same agency? A, yes, if the official discloses the payment. B, yes, because the official is not participating in the execution of the contract. C, no, because the official only received a small payment. D, no, and the contract may be voided. So I'll ask you to just answer in the question box. So most of you answered D. D is the correct answer. Uh, um, B is not the correct answer. Just because the official is not participating in the execution of the contract does not mean there's no conflict of interest. So I told you a couple of slides ago. <clears throat> that if a public official or employee has a financial interest in a contract, the contract is prohibited regardless of whether the official participates in or abstains from the actual decision. All right, this next question is a polling question. So here we go. Oh, wait. Uh. Actually, I think I might have, 
Actually, I think that was a polling question. The next one I have is about um, obtaining a permit. Okay. So I, I, think it's, I think it's, we haven't quite gotten there yet. Okay, let me go to that. Here we go. Okay, a member comes to the agency and asks how to obtain a permit. It is okay to A, ignore the person because this information is already available on the agency's website. B, tell the person to check the agency's code, then walk away. C, ask the appropriate agency staff member to assist the individual. D, refuse to answer the question because you dislike the individual's business. So this is a polling question. Yep, I'm launching it now. You all should have just seen it pop up. About 75% of you already participating, so I'll just give this a few more seconds here. Okay, you're sharing results? Yep. Okay, 100% of you got the right answer. The right answer is ask the appropriate agency staff member to assist the individual. Uh, here's an example of contractual conflict of interest. A county was brought, uh, brought an action against a county administrator, former county administrator, waste management company's vice president, billboard lessees, and other entities to recover for damages suffered as a result of two separate bribery schemes involving the defendants. The statute prohibiting public officials from obtaining a financial interest in any contract made by them in their official capacity was triggered because a public official received profit from a public contract. This actually was considered to include the acceptance of a bribe in return for influencing the public entity to enter into a particular contract. Um, conflicts created by future employment. So there are delays on the revolving door. Um, public employees may not participate in decisions involving a prospective employer. This includes interviews and negotiations. And officials in senior management may not represent parties before their former agency for one year after leaving office. Here's an enforcement decision. Dwayne S. served as a director on the Western Hills Water District Board of Directors. During his tenure, he voted on a matter directly relating to World International Inc., with whom he had an arrangement concerning prospective employment at the time of the vote. He was fined $4,000. Another example of conflict of interest is common law conflict um, involving personal interests or bias. So, Personal interests or biases, positive or negative, about the facts or the parties may cast doubt on your ability to make a fair decision. You need to exercise your power with at least the appearance of disinterested skill, zeal, and diligence. So this is a common trap for the unwary. Uh, many times um, on their Facebook pages or in newspaper interviews, public officials will um, indicate 
their opinion regarding prospective issues to be voted on by a city council. It's really important that you not express your final opinion until after the matter has been presented to the city council as a body and you've heard from the public. Um, there are examples where public officials have been forced to recuse themselves from a decision because their prior comments, uh, whether on Facebook or to a newspaper or elsewhere, um, indicated their intention to vote a particular way on an issue prior to having heard public comment on that issue. So that's a trap for the unwary to be avoided. Uh, procedural due process requires an unbiased decision maker. Uh, there should be no personal interest in the outcome, uh, bias of loyalty or friendship to the individual involved, no informational bias due to receipt of information outside of the public hearing. Uh, this applies to adjudicatory decisions such as use permits and design review. Um, it does not apply to legislative decisions. So informational bias due to receipt of information outside of public hearing. This is something that um, both planning commissioners and city council members run into. You are allowed to go visit a site um, that is the subject of a planning commission or city council decision. Many cities enact ordinances recommending that that site visit uh, and any conversation at that site visit be limited to an understanding of the dimensions and the um, physical aspects of the project uh, and that the entitlements of the project not be discussed. Also, uh, any site visits um, have to be done uh, with less than a quorum of city council members or planning commissioners. Uh, public interest versus personal interest. So in a case, City of Fairfield versus Superior Court, a councilman has not only a right, but an obligation to discuss issues of vital concern with his constituents and to state his views on matters of public importance. Campaign statements do not disqualify the candidate from voting on members which came before him after his election. Um, this is interesting. You see, you do have the obligation to discuss issues of concern um, and to state your views, but you should not state them in such a way that you're not capable of deciding differently upon learning of additional facts. In Nasha versus City of Los Angeles, a plaintiff was seeking to develop five lots in Los Angeles. While the matter was pending before the Planning Commission, one of the commissioners authored an article attacking the plaintiff's project. The Planning Commission voted to deny the project and in the lawsuit filed by the plaintiff against the City of Los Angeles, the, the court found that the Planning Commission's decision should be set aside due to an unacceptable probability of actual bias on the part of the commissioner who authored the article. So you see there is a fine line between expressing your views on issues of vital concern and expressing actual bias regarding a particular decision. Um, if disqualified, um, you should identify the applicable interest with specificity, step down from the dais and leave the room, and refrain from any discussion or participation. An exception to that is you may participate as a member of the public uh, on matters affecting personal economic interests. All right, I have mentioned a bunch of times um, the FPPC. Here are a couple of links to the FPPC website as well as a phone number. Your Institute for Local Government and your Legal League of California Cities are also resources for you. Okay, I'm now going to go over everyday ethical situations. So some of these will be the subject of polls, most will not. Here's the first one, this is not the subject of a poll. 
Recreation employees have access to city tables and chairs that are used for city events. These tables and chairs can be used by the public when part of an event being held on city property. The supervisor approaches the employee and asks, what is he doing? The employee responds that he's borrowing the table and chairs for his child's birthday party. Is this ethical behavior? Yes or no? You can answer in the question box. Obviously, uh, most of you have the correct answer. The answer is no. What if the employee had taken them without anyone stopping him and then forgot to return them? Is that ethical behavior? And again, the answer is no. I just want to clarify, the reason the prior answer was no um, is because the tables and chairs were permitted to be used when part of an event being held on city property. Um, and of course, the birthday party is not being held on city property, and it's not a public use. Here's the next one. This is not an official poll. Public works employees are directed to assist in the cleanup and disposal of outdated mechanical equipment. Part of the equipment has copper wiring. An employee removes the wiring both on the clock and off the clock. He sells it and keeps the profit. Is that ethical behavior, yes or no? You can answer in the question box. So again, most of you answered no. The answer is no. It does not matter that the uh, equipment is outdated. Uh, what does matter is that it's by virtue of his role as a public works employee that the employee had access to the equipment and he cannot profit from his job, from his public works job. All right, this next question is part of the official poll. During an inspection, the inspector sees a dresser that he likes and comments on it to the property owner. The property owner insists that the inspector take the dresser because it is going to be donated. Is it acceptable for the inspector to take the dresser? So this is an official poll and there's this is a yes or no answer and our moderator will open the poll. All right, you all should have just seen that pop up on your screen. Um, so is it acceptable for the inspector to take the dresser? Yes, no, we don't know. You all a little bit of time here to answer this. Eighty of eighty percent of you have responded, so we'll give this just another couple of seconds here. Okay. Okay, you should all be able to see the results on the screen now. Okay, and 92% of you said no. The answer is no. Um, it is actually a misdemeanor to receive any kind of gratuity or reward for performing one's duties. So here you have an inspector um, who is performing an inspection. So um, even if the dresser is going to be donated, and even if it has very little or no value, 
um, it still would be perceived as a gratuity or reward. And the only way it became available was because the inspector was performing an inspection. So uh, it would be construed as a gratuity or reward for performing one's duties. And it's actually a misdemeanor uh, to accept that. All right, here's the next one. During an investigation, the property owner produces evidence that he also gave the inspector a $1,000 check and testifies that you requested it as a loan and implied that giving him the money would keep his project running smoothly. The inspector claims it was for a side job inspecting the property owner's neighbor's house after a fire. Is that ethical behavior? Yes or no? And you can answer in the question box. So obviously the answer is no. Uh, we already went over the prohibition on uh, taking loans. Um, the only exception uh, allowing for loans is if it's a bank or a credit card or a relative. Here's the next one. A maintenance worker is responsible for emptying the trash cans in city parks. A resident reports that the employee was seen sorting through the trash and removing recyclables. Is that ethical behavior, yes or no? This is not an official poll, so you can just answer in the question box. So uh, some of you said yes, most of you said no. The better answer is no um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, the maintenance worker is responsible for emptying the trash. He's not responsible for removing recyclables unless that's part of his job description. So A, he would be performing a task for personal benefit while he's supposed to be performing his job. Um, B, if he's removing recyclables to sell um, and gain, uh, then he is gaining a prohibited advantage for performing his job. Now, if he wanted to look for recyclables, he should do it after his day is over and not on city property. He can go to you know, trash bins elsewhere. All right, here's the next one. During an arson investigation, the property owner mentions to the inspector that he's going to get rid of everything in this room. The inspector then asks if he can have a few pieces of furniture. The property owner agrees. Is that ethical behavior? This is not a poll question. You can answer in the question box. All right, and I already see a whole bunch of no's coming in. The correct answer is no. So employees actually have responsibilities greater than their counterparts in private industry. Employees are in the public eye and employment carries an obligation of personal integrity and conduct that serves to establish public respect, confidence, and trust. Soliciting or accepting in the course of employment, directly or indirectly for the employee's personal use, any gifts, gratuities, favor, promise of future benefit, discount not available to all public employees, entertainment, loan, or other things of value um, are prohibited. Here's our next one. The HR department is evaluating numerous proposals for new training software. Two HR employees are attending a conference where three of the companies bidding are sponsors. 
One of the company representatives provides the HR employees chips at a casino night valued at $375. Is that ethical behavior? This is not a poll, so you can answer in the question box. And all of you answered no. The correct answer is no. Um, employees may not act, or act in any manner, whether or not specifically prohibited by law, rule, practice, or procedure, which could be construed by an objective, reasonable person to result in or create the appearance of using public office for personal gain. So um, even if the HR employees um, did not uh, ultimately bid for the company that provided them with the chips, uh, simply accepting the chips could be perceived as a compensation or gift, um, which could create the appearance of using their public office for personal gain. Here's the next one. An employee in the general manager's office has access to legal bills submitted by outside employment counsel. One day, he happens to see in the narrative entry that his cousin in the IT department is going to be investigated for suspected harassment. He warns his cousin. Is that ethical behavior? This is not an official poll. You can answer <laughs> in the question box. I just saw one answer, no, with a whole bunch of O's on the end. And of course, no is the correct answer. Uh, employees must refrain from disclosing promulgating or validating information concerning city government or other employees and officials, which is false, confidential, protected by rights of privacy or common courtesy or disruptive to the work environment. All right, this next one is an official poll question. The fleet manager oversaw repairs to three city buses by an outside contractor at a city parking lot. The fleet manager then had the same contractor perform an oil change on his personal vehicle. Is that ethical behavior? Yes or no, and this is an official poll. Yeah, everybody should see that pop up on their screens right now, so please um, respond in that section right now. I give this just a few more seconds here. The vast majority of you have already participated. Let me put and close this and I will share your responses. Okay, so 86% of you said no. I'm gonna follow this up and then I'll give and then I'll discuss the answer. So what if the fleet manager submitted evidence that he was directly billed for the work performed on his personal vehicle? And what if he got a discount on the work? So um Yes or no? All right, so uh, most of you answered no. So here's the rule. No official or employee shall accept a fee, compensation, gift, payment of expenses, or any other thing of monetary value in any circumstances in which acceptance may result in or create the appearance of use of public office and or employment for personal or private gain, reduction of public confidence in the integrity of city government and or its employees. So going back to our poll question, this was not ethical behavior, um, particularly if the fleet manager did not pay for the oil change. 
but there are several issues with this. First, um, the fleet manager is avoiding the inconvenience of taking his vehicle to an, a dealership for an oil change. Uh, he is certainly ethically violating if he didn't pay for the oil change. And C, um, even if he paid for it, um, the appearance of um, using his office for personal or private gain would still be there for anyone who saw the um, contractor performing an oil change on the fleet manager's personal vehicle. So that answers this one. What if he had submitted evidence he was directly billed? He still got it done at his work site and not at a, a vendor's place of business. And it still creates the appearance of personal private gain. And certainly if he got a discount on the work, that's also unethical. So all three of these, the answer is no, it's not ethical behavior. All right, this is not an official poll question. A library employee is seen using a city computer during working hours to sell personal items on eBay, search profiles on eHarmony, browse Facebook and Twitter, and watch videos on YouTube. Coworkers estimate that he spends close to four hours each day engaged in this conduct, which is visible to library patrons. Is that ethical behavior? You can answer this in the question box. Okay, the vast majority of you answered no. Would it make a difference if the employee was using a city computer that was not visible to patrons? You can answer in the question box. Okay, and most of you answered no. And would it make a difference if there was no personal gain? And again, all of you answered no. So here's the answer. City funds or property may never be used for personal or private use, gain or benefit. And employees must be absolutely honest in all dealings in whatever capacity with city funds, properties and facilities. Moreover, it's a conflict of interest to engage in private employment during the regular workday or while being paid by the city at the same time to render work for the city or while in or using city facilities or equipment. So again, the answer to all three of these questions is no. It's unethical to use the city computer during working hours for personal business. It does not make a difference if the computer is not visible to patrons. It does not make a difference if there's no personal gain. Here's the next one. A firefighter does not want to be the force hire, does not want to be on the force hire list. He accesses the staffing system to add hours and a vacation day to keep from getting force hired. Is this ethical behavior? You can answer in the question box. Many of you already are answering. You all have answered no. The correct answer is no. Examples of fraud include, but are not limited to, obtaining city funds or compensation through dishonesty. Okay, I just have a few more of these. Uh, employee has a city vehicle, which he is permitted to take home due to the fact that he responds to emergency callbacks. Uh, GPS and employee observation established that he leaves work early on most days and is using the city vehicle for personal errands. Is this ethical behavior? This is not a poll question. You can answer in the question box. And the answer is no. Funds or property may never be used for personal or private use, gain or benefit, and employees must be absolutely honest in all dealings in whatever capacity with city funds, properties, and facilities. What would be the proper approach for this employee? Uh, he should take the vehicle um, 
home um, and use his personal vehicle for running errands. An employee realizes that he made a mistake during an inspection. He retrieves the inspection report and modifies it to reflect what he should have done. He backdates it and replaces the original. Is this ethical behavior? This is not an official poll. You can answer in the question box. Many of you already are answering in the question box and your answer is no, and that's the correct answer. Employees must refrain from modifying or altering city documents, forms, or records in order to misrepresent facts or circumstances. Should a city record need to be modified, any modifications to city records should be noted with the signature and date of the employee making the modification. A city lifeguard also runs a private business providing swim lessons in the neighboring city. His promotional materials and website include photographs of him in his capacity as a lifeguard and pictures of city facilities. Is this ethical behavior? The answer is no. Some of you answered yes, and I understand uh, you might have answered yes because it's in a neighboring um, facility, a neighboring uh, city. But nevertheless, he is using um, pictures of city facilities and his likeness in his capacity as a city lifeguard to promote his private business, and that is unethical behavior. During an investigation, a municipality learns that the lifeguard also regularly maintains his website on a city computer and he uses the city copier to make promotional flyers. Is this ethical behavior? Most of you have answered the obvious answer, which is no. Again, public funds or property may never be used for personal or private use, gain or benefit, and employees must be absolutely honest in all dealings in whatever capacity with public funds, properties, and facilities. All right, two more. An employee calls in sick to work. Another employee is purchasing city supplies at Costco and sees the sick employee working at Costco. Is this ethical behavior? A bunch of you answered very quickly. The answer is no. Examples of fraud include, but are not limited to, obtaining city funds or compensation through dishonesty. You may say, well, he called in six, so he wasn't obtaining city funds, but actually, he was because employees get a certain number of sick days every year as a part of their benefit of working for the city. So he was gaining the benefit of his sick day uh, while earning money elsewhere. And here's the last one in this section. A code enforcement officer is accused of receiving free massages from businesses that he was responsible for inspecting. During the investigation, the employee alleges that he was undercover and attempting to bait employees into solicitation. Is this ethical behavior? And you can answer in the question box. All of you answered no. No is the correct answer. Um, an employee may not act in any manner, whether or not specifically prohibited by law, rule, practice, or procedure, which could be construed by an objective, reasonable person to result in or create the appearance of using public office for private gain. All right, so we've gone over a lot. Um, uh, be safe, safe, S, spot the issues, A, ask for help, F, Failure has consequences, E, ethics in practice. Uh, so familiar, familiarize yourself with laws that govern your service and when to ask questions. 
encourage you to think beyond legal restrictions and satisfy your AB 1234 requirement. You want to avoid these headlines And remember, the sooner you speak to legal counsel, the better. Uh, remember that the agency attorney represents the agency, not you personally. Reliance on advice from legal counsel is not a defense if your actions result in a violation. So you have to think for yourself as well as seeking counsel. Only a formal advice letter from the Fair Political Practices Commission protects you from violations of FPPC regulations. And you can get uh, that advice online um, at the FPPC website, the typical turnaround is two weeks. All right, and the last section of this, I have a few slides on transparency um, and public records. So the Brown Act covers all meetings of the legislative body of a local agency and must be open and public. All persons must be permitted to attend any meeting. A majority of the members of a legislative body shall not use a series of communications of any kind directly or through intermediaries to discuss, deliberate, or take action on any item of business that is within the subject matter of the legislative body. And serial meetings can occur in a couple of ways. The first is the daisy chain. If member A contacts member B and member B contacts member C and so on until a quorum has been involved, this type of serial meeting may result in a violation of the Brown Act. So if you have um, five members of your city council, then only two members uh, may discuss a potential issue among themselves outside of public. The other type of serial meeting is what's called hub and spoke, where an intermediary, such as an agency staff member, or even an applicant, contacts at least a quorum of the members to develop a collective concurrence on action to be taken by the legislative body. So um, if the city manager uh, speaks to each council member and communicates other council members position on an upcoming issue that would be hub and spoke that would be inappropriate here's an example in san jose san mayor sam licardo and other city council members uh, were found to have violated california's open meeting laws at least three times by discussing policy issues outside of public meetings um, so if six of San Jose's 11 city council members, including the mayor, chat about a policy in their offices or over a cup of coffee, even if no decision is made, they're violating the law, whether the discussions happen at once or in a series of conversations. For the council's multiple committees, which consist of five members, it would be illegal for three or more members to engage in discussions. So the issues that arose were a February memo from Licardo in support of state Senate Bill 3, which raised the state's minimum wage to $11 in 2016 and $13 in 2017, uh, garnered three signatures from the Rules Committee. Obviously, uh, the memo could only have two signatures uh, outside of a public meeting. Uh, Licardo then in May released a memo to explore expanding rent control with support from council members. Um, Licardo and the two council members, a voting majority, sit on the rules committee together. So it can be a trap for the unwary. You just uh, have to be careful that you populate your boards and commissions in such a manner as to avoid having members um, inadvertently participate in serial meetings. All right, here's a question. You are unsure how to vote at an upcoming meeting and request information from the city manager. Should you A, copy the email to the entire city council, B, hit reply all when the city manager responds to you and the entire city council, C, only email the city manager, D, none of the above you can answer in the question box um, 
this is not a polling question. And yes, most of you answered C. C is the correct answer. Um, it is acceptable to ask a question of um, an entire legislative body. If you do that, you have to say, you know, one way communication, please do not hit reply all. Um, but even asking a question could provide an indication of how you're considering to vote on a particular issue. And so the best approach is to only email the city manager with your question. The city manager can then forward information to all council members. Use of email or other technology slash media by a majority of a legislative body to discuss, deliberate, or take action on items within the body's jurisdiction violates the Brown Act. So this is an area that has gained a lot of attention in recent years, um, particularly with Facebook, Twitter, and texting. Um, so here are some recommendations. One, avoid sending emails to the entire body. If necessary, provide information only. So for example, if you sit on uh, a committee um, like MCCMC or you know a committee, a regional committee, you may forward to your entire council the agenda materials from that committee so long as all you do is forward it. You may not forward the materials with your editorial comments and do not solicit a response. Be careful when replying to emails. Do not communicate your position or make a commitment on a pending matter. Do not direct a reply to a majority of the body. This is something we covered a little bit earlier under our conflict of interest discussion. Um, you may not make a commitment on a pending matter. You may express your views uh, and um, additional information that you may be seeking, uh, but you must make sure they are your preliminary views. You cannot promise how you will vote on a pending matter or you may be precluded from voting. And remember, your email can be forwarded by others to a majority of the body. Non-meetings. An employee or official of a local agency may engage in separate conversations or communications outside of a meeting in order to answer questions or provide information so long as that person does not communicate to members of the legislative body the comments or positions of any other member or members. Okay, and our final several slides deals with access to public records. Access to public records is a constitutional right. Of course, a public record means any writing containing information relating to the conduct of the public's business, prepared, owned, used, or retained by any state or local agency, regardless of its physical form or characteristic. All of the agency's public records must be disclosed to the public upon request, unless there's a specific reason not to do so, such as the attorney-client privilege. As described by one court, islands of privacy floating in a sea of disclosure. Um, a city uh, settled a lawsuit over their alleged Public Records Act violation. Um, a resident won access to records about mold conditions at a neighbor's home, as well as $10,568 for attorney's fees. She had asked for copies of results from a mold inspection. The city clerk told her she could not have access to the documents because they were records of complaints and subject to the attorney-client privilege. Um, that position was inaccurate. Interestingly, uh, Public Records Act litigation, the winner, if it's, a, if, it's a pri if it's a private person who gains access to public records, they get their attorney's fees. If the public agency is sued and wins, the public agency does not get their attorney's fees unless um, the lawsuit was absolutely meritless. The following is a public record subject to disclosure. A, a message sent from your work email. 
B, a message from your personal email. C, a message sent from your personal email, but only when sent from an agency device. D, all of the above. This is our last question. You can answer in the question box. This is not an official poll. The answer is D, all of the above. So um, this is actually a fairly recent decision. Um, and you will see now that when public agencies receive Public Records Act requests, they will frequently write to city council members and other public officials seeking any communications from personal emails regarding that topic. So. Um, whether you send it from your work email, whether you send it from your personal email, whether you use an agency device or not, um, any communications concerning uh, matters of public business are public records subject to disclosure. Um, another trap for the unwary is that um, you may actually have to turn over your personal device if um, you are, if you perform city business on your personal device. So um, the best practice is to have separate um, computer at home from which you never do agency business and to have a separate agency device. Uh, local dis uh, officials have some discretion in terms of what records may be retained. It's important to follow records retention schedules and policies. This has become very relevant recently with respect to um, allegations of police misconduct. Public agencies are fully entitled to um, adhere to their records retention policies. But once they receive a Public Records Act request, they may not go back and delete relevant responsive records, even if those records are outside of the records retention policy. In considering these issues, uh, it's best to ask what would inspire public confidence and what decision best serves the interests of the community as a whole. Um, the LA school iPad scandal, there was a massive expansion of classroom technology that came to a halt in LA. The LA Unified School District had planned to buy 700,000 iPads for its students and teachers, um, but NPR member station KPCC obtained emails between DZ and tech executives that brought into question whether the initial bidding process was fair. So uh, when considering public perception, think about what would you want to read about on the front page? Even if you're confident about the right thing to do, you have to also consider public perception. The public needs to believe that the right thing has been done. Don't end your career this way. So that's the end of this formal presentation. We still have five minutes left. I'm gonna keep on the screen uh, the resources available to you. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to write them in the question box. We do have a couple of questions that I've seen come through, Joan, um, but I just want to make a couple of uh, quick housekeeping reminders for everybody. Um, we did cover a lot of content today, so we'll make sure to send out the slide deck um, with the follow-up email that goes out to all of you. Um, so don't worry about trying to write everything down. We'll send that out to you all. Um, and again, you'll receive your certificates via email within the next um, 30 days by the end of the month. Um, so let me go through a couple of the questions um, I've seen come through for you. Um, we have a couple going back to the gift section. Um, first, can you um, clarify what the current gift limit is? Yes. So uh, there's a note that somebody thinks it's $500 this, as of this year. Is that correct? It is 500 as of this year. Um, 
that's the annual limit. Okay, correct. Um, and then related to that, there's a question about um, disclosure of gifts in this Form 700. So um, is it appropriate to uh, disclose and summarize all gifts with just once per year on the Form 700? Or do you need to disclose any gifts over $50 within 30 days of receiving them? So the practice is to disclose all gifts uh, within 30 days, over $50 within uh, 30 days of receiving them. And there's an annual reporting requirement with the Form 700 that pertains with all potential issues raising conflicts of interest, not just gifts. Okay, perfect. So the answer is both. <laughs> it sounds like. Um, I think this one came in, um, I believe it was during the, the public records conversation. Um, and the question is, does an individual have the right to the identity of somebody filing, um, filing a complaint against the individual? You know, as a lawyer myself, I'm going to say it depends. So, um, <laughs> you know, it depends on the type of complaint. It depends on the status of the complaint. It depends on whether the complaint is, you know, human resources related or regarding a public issue. So that's um, a, it, that's an evaluation that should be made by the city attorney upon request of the Public Records Act request. Okay. Great. Um, another question, I've seen this one just came in um, related to the public, the quote public generally exception, exemption. Um, and the question is if that threshold was recently reduced to 15%. I don't understand the question. Oh, from 25 um, to 15%? It, it, the, the question doesn't, if the person who asked this question wants to clarify, that would be great. Um, but the question as it came in reads, um, for the the public generally exemption, was this threshold recently reduced to 15%? Somebody else is chiming in saying the FPVC changed it about a week ago. Is that, if that helps. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for that answer. Very new <laughs> thank you for that answer. Perfect. Um, and if you can, if uh, we have one more question, it looks like, um, if you can go back to, um, they're, they're referencing slide 82 or 83, it must have been one of the questions. Um, she's looking for the answer to that question. Okay. Not, maybe the one before that, it looks like there was a question on the real property question. Um, yes, I said. Yeah, I just so, want to make sure this is the right question. Is that the is that the question you're looking for to the it um, should be more than, individual? The answer is uh, C, but it should be 500, not 300. Uh, interests in real property are a a proper a potential ground for a conflict of interest. So that's the answer. The reason it was a trick question, as I explained, is that C said five more than 300 feet away, but uh, in 2019, the FPPC updated that to 500 feet away. So um, it, it is a problem if it's 500 feet away. It's definitely not a problem if it's 1,000 feet away. It may or may not be a problem if it's between 500 feet and 1,000 feet away. It uh, definitely is a problem if it's less than 500, 500 feet away. Okay. But the answer Thank is you. A. The answer is A. Yes, that it definitely could be a conflict. Perfect. Um, one final clarification question. Um, so the, I, I misinterpreted the, the question about um, the identity of the, of the filing complaint. So um, this has to do with uh, filing a complaint about using a property as a vacation rental. Um, and so in that instance, would an individual have the right to, I, to the identity of someone filing the complaint? Does that help clarify? It does help clarify. And again, I would rely on agency counsel because, you know, short-term rental issues are a hotbed in many cities. And um, people who are turning in other people, um, you know, 
it could be retaliatory, it could be um, whistleblower, perceived as whistleblower. So I would leave that decision to the city attorney. Perfect. Okay, we are right at five o'clock. Um, so I'm sure you all have either um, conference related things you want to get to or personal related things you want to get to. Um, so again, I'm Melissa Keene with ILG. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to follow up with me. Um, my email is on the, um, the presentation that you'll be receiving. Um, and so keep an eye out for that and keep an eye out for your certificates and um, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Um, so with that, definitely want to say thank you to Joan for presenting today. It's a whole lot of information to cover in a couple of hours. Um, and so thank you for that. And thank you for all, to all of you for joining us this afternoon. All right. Thanks, everybody.